the Old Time Gospel Hour, program 498, regular version. From the auditorium of the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, the Faith Partners and Friends present Jerry Falwell and the Old Time Gospel Hour, celebrating 25 years of Christian ministry. be seated. I'm speaking today from the second chapter of the Proverbs, and as you know, we're going through the entire 31 chapters week after week. The theme is learning to live successfully. The theme of success and the definition of success must be understood. From God's point of view, success is getting into the will of God as early in life as possible and staying there for all of your life. That's real success. And Proverbs, all the Proverbs are written through Solomon and others, sententious sayings, and inspired by the Spirit of God so that every Christian can be successful individually, as a family, in our homes, our businesses, our churches, nationally and internationally. This is the plan, the Word of God. Proverbs chapter 2 our message for today. In America, the word Bible is synonymous with the King James Version of 1611. This happens to be a King James Version of the Bible. This is the fourth edition, and the chances are that is what you have in your hand. Uh, since 1611, there have been four major editions of the King James Version. Well, I happen to have in this slipcover the very first version, a collector's edition, the very first version, the 1611 version of the King James Bible, and the very latest, the 1982 easy to read fifth edition coming out right now, Thomas Nelson Publishing Company, the publisher. This is a pre publication edition. Nobody yet has either of these, just as we're doing them. And today we're going to make them available to 5,000 people who are watching the Old Time Gospel Hour. I wish we could do it for everybody, but only 5,000 people in all of the United States and Canada, Australia, the Philippines, wherever the program is received, only 5,000 can get this special collector's edition, pre-publication original King James, 1611 edition, and you probably can't read the words because they didn't spell the same way then. And the fifth, not yet on the bookshelves, the fifth major edition of the King James Version, those two, and we're actually numbering that new edition, that easy to read edition, we're numbering it one to 5,000, I'm personally inscribing it to 5,000 special people who would like to have one time only and never again offered, the very first edition ever printed of the King James Version, and the very latest one just coming out right now, and they're not even available anywhere but right here, right now. And the first 5,000 will be numbered in maybe 371 years from right now if the Lord hasn't returned. Your great, 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 so forth grandchildren We'll say this is number 312 of the fifth edition, numbered. Nobody else in the world has it. Just 5,000 people. More about that later and into the second chapter of Proverbs later. But right now, the old time gospel hour choir.
Thank you, choir. We broadcast the Old Time Gospel Hour into Australia, among other nations, and I'm happy to announce that I'll be visiting Australia May 20 through 23. We'll be in Sydney. Word of Life, Brother Dave Hillis, director, has invited us there, and we're looking forward to meeting many of our, our Australian friends at that time. We've been making available to a lot of people for a lot of times books and albums and materials that can be and hopefully are a blessing to our people. I hope you have a daily devotional Bible reading time at your house. I hope that every day you read just a little from the scriptures and have a time of prayer. And I have a book, the most recent one that we have published and printed entitled Keys to Daily Living that I think is excellent for use in your devotionals. What has happened is in six chapters, our own staff here has taken from my sermons over the past few years, quotations, comments, excerpts, and divided them into six chapters entitled Keys to Faith, Keys to Purpose, Keys to Thankfulness, uh, Keys to Testings, to Suffering, to Perseverance to help you in a practical way to learn how to live, how to overcome trials and troubles and heartaches and heartbreaks. This book is selling for $3 in bookstores, but we're giving them away to any and all who call our toll-free number, 1-800-446-5000. And when you dial, simply ask for a free copy of Keys to Daily Living. Ask for it by name, Keys to Daily Living. If the line's busy, keep trying till you get through. Someone is by the phones 24 hours a day. If you happen to live in Virginia, Hawaii, Alaska, or Canada, that telephone number does not work. You must write me to get your free copy of Keys to Daily Living. Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia. Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia, 24514. Whether calling, or writing, whatever, I hope you'll get a copy. One per household, please but it's free, and I hope you'll call us today. We have Liberty Baptist College students by the phones, and staff members by the phones, and they can take and do take sometimes as many as 15,000 phone calls in one day. So just call right now and say, send me my free copy of Keys to Daily Living, 1-800-446-5000. The Sounds of Liberty are coming to sing for us right now. These young people are a part of the student body of Liberty Baptist College. And although summer is moving upon us quickly, any of you who'd like to enroll at Liberty Baptist College for this fall, the 82-83 school year, you need to call us on the toll-free number and get a free LBC catalog because we're going to be packed this time. Our enrollment, pre-enrollment right now is 20% ahead of last year. And last year, we had the fastest growth of any such Christian school in the world, as far as we know, and the fastest growth in Virginia of any school. And uh, we would just like to say that uh, we'd love to have your son, your daughter, at Liberty. We now have uh, many, many, many different majors, 33, I believe, majors in various areas, training young champions for Christ. Here are the sounds of Liberty. Maybe at morn when the day is awaking, when sunlight through darkness and shadow is breaking, that Jesus will come in the fullness of glory to receive from the world his own. Oh, Lord Jesus. Jesus, how long, how long ere we shout the glad song? Christ return and hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. It may be at midday, it may be at twilight. It may be perchance that the 
Shouting in the skies From the multitudes that rise Will be changed In the twinkling of an eye Oh, Lord Jesus, how long How long can we shout the glad song Thank you, Sounds of Liberty. Could I talk to you at home, heart to heart, for a few moments? The month of May needs to be a miracle month. We need a miracle in May. We're asking God to give us 5,000 friends, maybe 5,000 friends like you, who will invest $1,000 this month in our television radio ministry. Because of inflation, the costs have gone sky high, even the last few months. And then during January, February, and March, the whole nation, it seems, was inundated by snowstorms. And the mail flow was curtailed, and our offerings were down. We're asking God to help us not to eliminate any of the stations from our network. Not this station, not any. And yet we cannot allow deficits to accrue. And so we were in that dilemma where we must have a miracle. And I want you to be a part of it. Now, immediately someone is saying, Jerry, there's no way I could give $1,000, and I understand that. But you can pray, because I am convinced that watching me right now, there are somewhere in this nation or someplace, there are 5,000 individuals who, if God spoke to your heart, if you really wanted to see this program continue on this station and on hundreds of stations giving the gospel of Christ to millions, you could sacrificially give $1,000 if I can find 5,000 friends during this month of May who can do that, we will have that miracle. Will you be one of them? I wish I could come right there and sit in your living room and tell you what we're doing, what God's doing through us, what we're trying to do, and how badly we need your help. 5,000 persons giving $1,000 each, a tax-deductible investment in our television radio ministry. I was trying to think, what can I give to the 5,000 friends who will do this that would really be a significant token of my appreciation. I think I came up with it. I went to the Thomas Nelson Publishing Company, the largest Bible publishers in the world. I learned that they have an original 1611 edition of the King James Bible and that they also are coming out later this year with the fifth revision of the King James Version of the Bible. It's the 1982 easy to read King James Bible that many Bible scholars from Tennessee Temple University and Chattanooga, Moody Bible Institute, Liberty Baptist College and others, scholars put together, over a hundred scholars. It's true to the old original text, but it's easy to read. And there's 371 years between the 1611 edition and the new 1982 edition that's not on the bookshelves yet. I asked the publisher to reserve me the first 5,000 copies that come off the presses. He agreed to do it. And so we have the first 5,000, and we're going to number them, 1 to 5,000, and that will be a collector's edition. And that is one of the two books that is in this slipcover. The first one is the old 1611 edition, 371 years old in the original. This is a reproduction, of course. And book number two is the brand new, not off the presses yet, 
1982, easy to read King James Version of the Bible. I want you to have these two. They're in a beautiful, genuine leather cover. Beautiful, just beautiful. I want you to have both of them. I'll be inscribing the, the new one to you, and it will be numbered so that you'll be one to 5,000 somewhere there, and nobody else in the world will ever have that. Your children and children's children will thank God that you got this collector's edition, this history-making collector's edition, the old uh, 1611 edition and the 1982 edition, and you have them at your house. That's my way of saying thank you when I sign it to you, when I inscribe it to you, when we put your number on it and mark it as a collector's limited edition. Uh, it's our way of saying thank you for investing $1,000 in our television radio ministry in this month of May. You know, I was just looking at the 1982 easy-to-read King James Bible, Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 2. It reads this way, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In the old King James Bible, 371 years old, it reads the way you're seeing it on the screen right now. Now, we haven't changed anything. Oh, it's still true to the text, but it is easier to read. I think you'll agree, and I think you'd like to have both of them. This Bible, the brand new one, that is coming out after we get our 5,000 first, and they're being hand-tooled, by the way. When you write to me here in Lynchburg and say, I want one, you send your $1,000 check. Thomas Nelson Company will then hand-tool the Bible just for you, number it with your number, and we'll tell you what that number is immediately, and then I'll be personally inscribing it to you. In that slip cover on your library shelf, besides something you'll read often, it's something you'll pass on to your children and children's children. Will you please write to me, Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia, and say, Jerry, here is my $1,000 investment in the Old Time Gospel Hour. If you can do more, please do. But when you write, I guarantee you, if you write and are among the first 5,000 people who write, you will get one. Now, if you happen to be 5,001, or you're too late, please write today. Write to me here in Lynchburg, Virginia, and say, Jerry, here's my check. Make it payable to the Old Time Gospel Hour. We need a miracle in May. I, I don't want to go off this station or any station. Right now, we're going to put the American and the Canadian address on the screen. I want you to write it down. I want you to write me a letter immediately, and we'll see if you're among the first 5,000 writing that you get this collector's edition. Just before my message today from Proverbs chapter 2, Mac Evans comes to sing. While Mac is coming, let me introduce one of our dearest friends from way out Arizona way. You'll know her best as the person who dreamed up, produced, made available the little precious feet symbol for the pro-life movement, one like I'm wearing right now. This is Virginia Evers. Virginia, would you stand, please? Let's welcome her to our service. So glad to have you. Thank you, Virginia. And she is heading up the Year of the Unborn Child Project. No one in America is doing more for the human and fundamental rights of the unborn than Virginia Evers. What's the name of your hometown out there? Taylor. Taylor, Arizona, Mrs. Virginia Evers. God bless you. Mr. Mac Evans. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, how he loved you and me. Oh, how he loved you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how me. Oh, how he loved you and me. Oh, how he loved you and me. Oh, how he loved you and me. Oh, 
was not willing that any should perish, but that through him all might come to repentance. Oh, how he loved me. Oh, how he loved you. Oh, how he loved you and me. For Jesus said in his word, all that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. For he is not willing that any should perish. The door is open wide. He said, he that will come, I will give him with this water of life. Give it to him freely. For he gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loved me. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loved you and me. Proverbs chapter 2 page 974 in the Faith Partner Study Bible. As you turn there, I wish all of you would pray with me that during the month of May, in the 31 days of that month, God will give us 5,000 friends who will make an investment in the Old Time Gospel Hour, our television, radio, ministry worldwide is by far the most expensive thing in the which we're involved. I know very few people can do what I'm asking. I'm asking for 5,000 individuals who will invest $1,000 in the Old Time Gospel Hour. Not many can do that, and someone is saying right now, that's not me. I'm asking that many, 5,000 persons, will write me a letter. Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia, and say, Jerry, Here's my investment. Here's my gift toward supporting the television radio ministry of Old Time Gospel Hour that is bringing thousands to Christ, bringing the gospel to millions. Your gift is tax deductible. And if you have any questions about what that gift should be and so on, just ask me in the letter. We'll get right back to you. And each of the 5,000 persons who make that major gift to underwrite Old Time Gospel Hour will send these two Bibles. One is 371 years old. That is, it was in the original. It is the 1611 King James Version. The other is the newest, the 1982 fifth edition of the King James Version, the easy to read revision. Published by Thomas Nelson Publishing Company. Scholars from Tennessee Temple University in Chattanooga, Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, Liberty Baptist College here in seminary, and other schools across the country participated, over 100 scholars. Seven years of work. And here it is. And this is pre-publication. It's collector's edition, 5,000 copies, and each of them will be numbered, one through 5,000. And I'll be signing each one to the person who makes that major investment, and they will, it will never be available again. And as soon as we get our 5,000th letter saying, I want those two books, and here's my investment in the television radio ministry of Old Time Gospel Hour. As soon as I get that here in Lynchburg, Virginia, or Box 505, Richmond Hill, Ontario, in Canada, whether you're writing here or Canada, as soon as we get the 5,000th letter, it's all over. We're not going to print anymore. They're being hand-tooled, by the way. Thomas Nelson is hand-tooling them for the 5,000 people who order them and inscribed to you and numbered for you. And most importantly, you'll be helping us. This is our way of thanking you for, for the 5,000 friends who help us keep this ministry going in difficult times in this country. Proverbs chapter 2, page 974 in the Faith Partner Study Bible, beginning with verse 1. Let's read, shall we, all the verses together. 
My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. When wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they froward in their paths, to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which, which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the God of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God, for her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men, and keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect, or the blameless, shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth, and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, we are so grateful that we have a book that tells us the way to heaven, the way to salvation, the way to a personal relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. We're all so glad that we have a book that tells us how to live after we have believed the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ in our behalf. Thank you for the book of Proverbs. And may as we look into this second chapter of the Proverbs today, may our hearts be warmed, our eyes opened, our spirits illumined, and may we learn how to better serve Thee. In Jesus' name, amen. As we looked at chapter 1 in our first study, we saw that there are several emphases in the Proverbs. Solomon was the man God used to write most of them and to gather all of them. Solomon is known as the wisest man who ever lived. Solomon was not a perfect man, but he was God's man. And Solomon, under divine inspiration, put together these 31 chapters of the Proverbs to give us the major theme of living successfully in this life. The definition of success is, according to the Word of God, getting into, learning, finding out the will of God as early as possible in life and then staying in it for the rest of your life. God wants me to be a success personally. And I repeat what I said earlier. Success by God's criteria may be totally different than the success standards set by the world. It is not always wealth. It isn't always health. It isn't always fame. The Apostle Paul, for example, was converted late in life. And all of his Christian life was one of hardship, deprivation, punishment, harassment, and he finally died as a martyr in a Roman dungeon. So life, uh, success in life is not necessarily success by the standards of the world. And Paul himself, in his last uh, days on, uh, on this earth, said, I'm ready to be offered. I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. I have fought a good fight, and I'm sure he got that crown he was talking about, and he heard the Lord say, well done. He was a successful man, but not in the eyes of the world. Now, God wants you to be successful by getting into his will as early as possible and staying in it all of your life. And God wants your family to be successful according to biblical principles. And God wants uh, your church, your community, your business, your, your work to be successful. I believe God wants our nation to be successful. God has a success plan for the whole world. 
And whenever men are failing and falling apart and homes are disintegrating and lives are self-destructing, always it's because we're violating the success plan that God's given us in, in His Word. And the book of Proverbs is the most concise set of blueprints for successful living to be found in all 66 books of the Bible. Beginning now with the first five verses, we have what I call my ten verbs. If you're an English student or a former student, you know what a verb is. If you're not an English student, you need to know what a verb is. It denotes action. A verb is the action word. And here in the first five verses of Proverbs 2, we have ten verbs that are necessary to be understood and acted upon if, in fact, we're to have the good things that we're going to see a little bit later in the lesson today. The first verb, verse 1, My son, if thou wilt receive my words. The verb is receive. Verb number 1, my verb. I must receive God's words. We've been talking about the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, it's wonderful to have a beautiful Bible or many beautiful Bibles. But to have Bibles and to be receiving the Word of God are two different things. In this audience today of several thousand and millions watching by television, some are receiving the Word, but the majority are not. Now I know all your eyes are directed right here. And I can see your ears are turned up. And I can tell that you're wide awake unless, like some, you've developed the art of sleeping with your eyes open. I'm very much aware that you're looking this way. But what gets from my mouth to your ears is not necessarily received. Some of you are not receiving what you're hearing because of last night and what happened or what shouldn't have happened or what's going to happen this afternoon, or what's going on at home right now, or some boy or some girl. Your mind is somewhere else. There may even be a few who are not receiving because you've made up your mind. This Bible is not the Word of God. God has no message for me. And though it may hit your ears, it never gets to your intellect and certainly not to your heart. But receiving the Word means taking it into your mind, into your emotions, into your will, into your heart, it's receiving it gladly. What happens when that occurs? Well, Acts 2.41 tells the story of how when Peter had preached on the day of Pentecost, a great soul-winning sermon, exalting Christ. After that, verse 41, it says, They that gladly received, received his word, were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. 3,000 people heard Peter preach that sermon gladly received his words about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and became Christians that day and were baptized in 24 hours. Receiving the Word of God always brings about change. That's why you should go to church. That's why you should read your Bible. That's why uh, this morning I had such a very good time at about 6.30 a.m. reading the Word of God. It was God talking to me, and my verb is to receive it. The second verb and hide my commandments with thee. We are uh, told in the Psalms that we are to hide the Word of God away in our hearts that we might not sin against the Lord. The word we would use is memorization. It's good to receive the Word of God. It's also good to memorize it. When I was in college 30 years ago, Baptist Bible College, Springfield, Missouri, uh, one or two of our professors, two of our professors, uh, gave some heavy memorization projects. One professor particularly would sometimes close his class with one little simple sentence. Uh, by next class, memorize Romans chapter 8, or Romans 6, or John 3, or John 5. That was easily said, quickly said, but it really took work. But just this past week with Tommy Trammell at Deer Park Baptist in Cincinnati, we were chatting about what was most profitable to us when we were in Bible college and we all agreed, and always this comes out this way, we were classmates then, the memory work we did. Because hiding the Word of God away in our heart, we were really building up a storehouse, a treasury, that all down through life we could call back on, spiritual recall, at the moment when we need it most. Young people, I want to say all, to all the young people listening to me, you have a little something that you'll be losing a little bit of every year that passes in your life, and that's the ability to remember when you're young, you can remember and indelibly imprint upon your mental computer verses of Scripture that you may not be able to do quite so easily 25 years from now. 
I challenge you to hide the Word of God away in your heart. But we all ought to be memorizing Scripture and hiding it away so that God can bring it to our remembrance at the hour when we need it in practical everyday life. Verb 3 is in verse 2. So that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom. Incline means to lean toward. So we receive it, the Word of God. That's Bible reading. That's church attendance. That's hearing the Scriptures. Secondly, we are to hide, to memorize that Word, keep it in our hearts. And three, we're to lean towards what it's saying. You know, I can look into the faces of a lot of people I preach to and tell they really are with it. They're not, uh, they're not uh, standing up in church and saying something out loud. Those folks are usually not listening. But it's the people who are going like this ever so often. Uh, you can look right down at them and you see the head nod a little bit. That means I got it, preacher, and I agree with you. Ever so often you'll get one of those brother whirlies who will say, Amen. I mean a big bass bullfrog, Amen. You'll know that means I got it, preacher. You're right, I'm with you. And that's where, the way our heart is supposed to be towards the Word of God. When you're reading the Bible and you're private time. You ought to be saying, Lord, that's, that's right. You're right on here. That's, that's just what I needed. I agree with you. Now, it's the Word of God whether you agree with it or not. But once you agree with it and incline your heart toward it, it does you some good. You get on the positive side and things start happening. Start, it's a, a matter of attitude of the heart. Then the fourth verb, and apply thine heart to understanding. Without application, the other three are worthless. To receive the Word of God, to memorize Scripture, to lean toward it and incline, that's all great. It's like asking people about abortion. Everybody's pro-life. You just can't find anybody today, Virginia, who's not pro-life. They'll all say, oh, yes, I'm pro-life. What do you mean by that? Are you for a human life amendment? Are you willing to stop the murder of one and a half million little babies a year in this country? Oh, no, I'm against that. I, I believe in choice. I believe in choice, too. Choice before the conjugal act, before life becomes a reality. Make your decisions before you commit the act. But after life has come into being, the decision is the little baby has the right to live just as much as the mother. Well, now, all of life is that way. You see, you must apply these principles. When you read the Bible and the Spirit of God convicts you of some sin in your life, that's great. Conviction is a wonderful thing. That guilt, that misery, that conscience that's bothering you, that's great. But until you apply what you've heard and stop doing it, it hasn't helped you any. You know, when you're working with an alcoholic, until you can get an alcoholic to acknowledge that what he's doing is sin, you can't help him. It's like working with a homosexual. As long as he thinks this is normal, and so many people are telling them that, this is normal, this is an acceptable lifestyle, there's nothing wrong with this, as long as he believes that, you cannot help him. But we have, thank God, been allowed to help many alcoholics, many homosexuals, many drug addicts, you name it, uh, we've been able to help them to a brand new life in Christ, a life of deliverance, a brand new lifestyle. It always begins when they receive the Word of God and they hide it in their hearts and they lean toward it and say, yes, it's true and I will apply it in my life. I'll stop living this way. I'll trust Jesus Christ as my Lord, my Savior, and my strength and my deliverer. And if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now that's application. In your own life, what is the Spirit of God dealing with you about? Things to do that you're not doing? Things to stop doing that you are doing? Apply thine heart to understanding. Application. Be doers of the Word, not hearers only. Then verb number five, yea, if thou criest after knowledge. If thou criest after knowledge. This verb criest means or implies hunger, thirst, longing after not only must I receive the Word of God and act upon it, but I need a hunger in my heart for more of Jesus, a hunger for more of His Word. And there's something about the growth in grace that creates that hunger. It's sort of a spontaneous thing. Hunger, longing after, seeking after. And I think it implies here prayer. I think it means a verbalizing of prayer, crying unto God. And this Word of God, as we look into it, it, is a, it creates a two-way street, a conversational street. The Word is God talking to me. Prayer is me talking to God. And as we get those two lanes of traffic going, something happens. The next verb, and liftest up thy voice for understanding. Liftest. It means now that I'm beginning to pour intercession and supplication and praise and prayer and worship to God. And again, it's an active verb. It's getting something out from my innermost being that I'm now offering up to God. Verse 4, if thou seekest her as 
silver and searches for her as for hid treasures. Here, verses 7 and 8. Seeking after silver, searching for hid, hid treasure. Here again is an attitude of heart. How, what happens in the, in the heart when you really fall in love with God and the word becomes the delight of your soul? You know, if we were to announce that there's $100 million worth of silver hid around Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, and it's in public places, and whoever finds it first can have it, there would not be a tree left standing by tonight. There, there would not be a street that wasn't dug up and impossible to travel on. And I suspect there'd be some holes in brick walls and every public wall in the area. Silver. The old gold rush uh, fee, uh, uh, disease would suddenly creep in upon our people. And everybody be going after something. Treasure hunts. That's the way we're to go after the Word of God. This Bible, when you open it, ought to be so exciting to you that you just know there's a nugget here and a nugget there and something good here and something good there. And as you read the Word of God every time, you may have read that passage a hundred times earlier before, but God will give you something new you never saw before this time if you approach God with that expectancy and that spiritual excitement. God doesn't want you to be victimized by boredom. Bored Christians need not be so. There's nothing monotonous about the Christian life. Something new every day. Something going on unsuspected every day. And then, verse 5, then shalt thou understand, that's verse 9, the fear of the Lord. What begins to happen in the Christian life? As you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, you begin to have spiritual understanding. And the one natural conclusion of all of this is you develop a real fear of the Lord. Not many people today fear God. Obviously, by the way this nation is living, there's little fear of God in it. That doesn't mean that God shouldn't be feared, and we will one day understand that we should have feared Him. But the fact is that very few people fear God. If that were not true, you couldn't get the doctors to perform the abortions. You couldn't get the printers to print the pornography. If people feared God, uh, you, you, there's no way you could get people to peddle the drugs and wipe out the little children today. If people feared God, you could not get the movie technicians to create the films and the hardcore and softcore porn you know, they'd be, the magazines on the newsstands, they would not be in the stores because the owners of those stores would fear God and wouldn't allow pornography on the shelves of their stores if they really feared God. But there'll come a time when we do fear God. And the way we live every day towards God tells whether we fear the Lord or not. When you get close to God, you'll have an understanding of the fear of the Lord. And finally, verse 10, and find the knowledge of God. Find the knowledge of God. You see, you don't uh, just accidentally stumble upon a good, healthy relationship with God. You work at it. There are no shortcuts to holiness. You work at it every day. You work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It has nothing to do with getting you to heaven. But because you're on the road to heaven, you want to be a little more like Christ every day on the way. Now, those are the ten verbs that I call my ten verbs if I'm going to be successful. Now, let's look at God's five verbs. They're found, beginning with verse 6, For the Lord giveth wisdom. I said a while ago that wisdom is seeing things from God's point of view. Seeing things from God's point of view. That's what wisdom is here in the book of Proverbs. Seeing things from God's perspective. How do I get that kind of wisdom? How can I see things the way God sees them? If I could see my problems the way God sees them, I wouldn't worry so much. Wisdom is imparted. How do the swallows know how to go to the same place every time? Is there a convention somewhere where they work these things out? No. Imparted wisdom. God. How does a spider know how? The little spider, how to spin that beautiful web? Granddaddy? No. Imparted wisdom. Now then, God imparts wisdom. As we go to His Word, as we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, God gives us wisdom. And there's something that the people who are sitting under white hair here today have that no young people have because something called time is necessary for an impartation of that wisdom. And you can have wisdom as a young man, but as you get older, you should have more and more and more of that. That's the first thing, giveth. The second verb, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. As you open the word, God just pours his word. Out of his mouth, he's giving you knowledge, information. The best educated person in this building, listen carefully, because you PhDs right now, I got your antenna up. The best educated person in this building 
is the person who has the best understanding of the Word of God. Because yesterday's newspaper is worthless. You can read the newspaper to see what happened yesterday. You can watch the television newscast to see what's happening today. But you can read this book to find out what's going to happen tomorrow. This is the Word of God. The best educated person in this building is the best student of the Word of God in this building. Whoever that happens to be. Only God knows. And then the third verb, verse 7, He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. Layeth up. God is stacking up. He's building He's building a reservoir of spiritual traits and characteristics for us. As we get older and have the bad experiences and the good ones and the good times in the Word and the convicting times in the Word, God's laying up. He's building a house inside of us. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment. Keepeth the paths of judgment. You see, He's also our protector. He's our buckler. God's man is indestructible until he's finished the work God's called him to do. You don't have to be afraid of death. Uh, my wife and I were talking about this last night. A friend of ours is always talking about death. He's scared to death to, scared to, death to die. That's all he talks about. He's just sure that, you know, this, he's, this pain is cancer. Just no way. It's got to be cancer. Everything is death. I never think about it. Now, I know I'm going to die. You don't have to write me another letter on that. I know I'm going to die. <laughs> I've been doing that for a long time. But it never crosses my mind, and so help me, I never have a moment of fright or concern about it. Because I know where I'm going to spend eternity. I've made preparation already to go over where He is, our Lord, and spend eternity there, and that's a long time. So I don't have to be afraid of terminating a little short existence down here. And neither do you have to be afraid of that. And so He's our buckler. He'll take care of you. He'll watch over you. Then... He preserveth, his verb 5, he preserveth the way of his saints. He's our preserver. He'll see to it that you make it. He will finish in you what he has started. Whenever I sign a Bible, if I put a signature on it, I don't particularly like to do it, but when I have to, I do. I put Philippians 1, 6 under that, being confident of this very thing, that God, who hath begun a good work in you, will perform it or finish it until the day of Jesus Christ. God always finishes what he starts. Now, we see our ten verbs, you can write up there my ten because they're yours too, our ten verbs and God's five verbs. Now, what happens when you understand those fifteen verbs in action? Here they are. Verse 9, then shalt thou understand three things, righteousness, or that's right living, and judgment, that's discernment or discretion, and equity, or giving everybody a fair deal, yea, every good path. Right living. You want to live right? Read the Word of God. It will tell you what's right and what's wrong. And when you get those 15 verbs in action, your 10 and God's 5, God will tell you when you're doing wrong and He'll encourage you when you're doing right. You'll have the witness within you. The Spirit of God is there. Secondly, judgment. A friend of mine the other day said, Oh, I just wish I never had to make another decision. What a boring life this would be. No decisions. Every morning when you get up, you've got impossible problems in front of you. Questions that have no answers, problems that have no solutions, at least they appear that way when you get up. But if you'll go to God and get these 15 verbs moving, at the right moment when you need to make the decision, you'll know what to do. That's the thrilling thing about this life. God puts all the pieces together. It's like a master jigsaw puzzle. And he's always on time, never late, never ahead of time. Puts the right piece in at the right time. And when you get to that door, it's obvious this is the one I should walk through. You didn't know it five minutes ago, but you know it now. And it's so simple, you wonder why you didn't know it all the time. But that's the Spirit of God leading. The still, small voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. And the end result is God will spare you from two disastrous lifestyles. The first one is... You'll find this in verse, uh, verse 10. When wisdom entereth to thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion or discernment shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, here it is, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man. The evil man here in Proverbs 2 is representative of uh, dishonesty, violence. He goes on to say the man that speaketh froward things who 
Leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil, delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they throw it in their paths. God wants to keep you free from dishonesty, from crookedness, from violence. The reason this world is in such a violent upheaval is because situational ethics. No God. So Mr. Castro and Mr. Brezhnev, they're co-partners in the Central American uh, venture right now. Nicaragua is just their conduit for exportation of revolution all throughout Central America. How could they possibly, uh, Marxist-Leninism since 1917, have murdered 142 million people? Because situational ethics. Anything goes if it furthers our cause since we have no code of ethics, no absolutes, no Bible, no God. That's anarchy and that's the kind of thing that can happen in the United States of America if we turn away from the Judeo-Christian principles on which the nation was built. And so we have it. God wants to deliver us from that. And then secondly, to deliver thee, verse 16, from the strange woman. Immorality. God, young people, wants to deliver you from immor immorality. Whether it's promiscuous heterosexuality or homosexuality or premarital sex or extramarital sex, it's all wrong. God has a plan. His ideal plan is that a man should legally marry a woman and that together that couple should raise up children to love God and train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's the home. That's the family. That's all the family there is. There just isn't any diverse family form. And we need to get back to that principle, back to that standard. And that's what this book is telling us. And we don't have to have the Hollywood pattern. We've got the Bible pattern. We don't have to follow Mr. Lear's pattern. We've got the Bible pattern. We've got a biblical plan, and it works. It's worked for us for 200 years. Let's get back to it. Shall we bow together in prayer? There are people here today who need Christ as Savior. How many of you here will say, Jerry, I'm not a Christian. If I died today, I don't know I'd go to heaven. Or I am a Christian, but I'm not living for the Lord as I should. My life is not what it ought to be. You touched on some things today that are bothering me. I have some spiritual needs right now, whoever you are, wherever you are. If you have a spiritual need of any kind, you'll say, Jerry, pray for me. Would you raise your hand high, please, all over this building? Just slip it up right now. God bless every one of you. God bless you. The balcony is the main floor. God bless you. Our heads are bowed. God loves you. Christ died for you. And right where you're sitting there in the pew by the television set, just bow your head. Acknowledge that Christ died on the cross for you, rose from the dead for you, and receive him into your heart as your Savior. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I confess that I'm a sinner. I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I will serve you for the rest of my life as you give me strength. In Jesus' name, amen. While our heads are still bowed, in a few moments, I'll invite those of you here in the auditorium who need to come to walk down the nearest aisle. We'll meet you, go with you to a prayer room, give you some literature, pray with you. Watching my television, write to me. I'll send you a free copy of that same material. My booklet entitled, How to Get Started Right, will be sent you, no charge. If you still have questions about your salvation, give me your telephone number. We'll call you, J.O. Grooms and others, at our expense. Lead you to Christ on the telephone. If you have prayer requests, give me that prayer request. I'll answer you personally. We'll pray for you by name, by need. Brother Worley. Brother Harbin, Brother Sheehan, so many of our prayer warriors, the Horsleys, the Rudders, pray for you by name. If you have a special need for counseling, there's a prayer hotline available 24 hours a day. Just dial it. If you're deaf, we have an emergency line for physical and spiritual needs, free, TTY. Let's stand to pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, help men and women and boys and girls everywhere, right here and by television, to look to the cross, to look to the Word of God, to look to the Lord Jesus Christ and find in Him the embodiment of all of our needs fulfilled. In Jesus' name, amen. While our heads are bowed, I want to ask that no one irreverently disturb the service, no one move around, everyone with a need, upstairs or down, I want to ask you right now to step out from your seat. Come and meet one of the pastors. If you need salvation, we'll go with you to the prayer room and lead you to Christ. If you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, I want you to come. If you just want to kneel at this altar, do that. If you want to join our church today, if God's calling you to the ministry, come on.
whatever your need. If you came to church with a hunger and a hurt in your soul, don't leave that way. Come right now. While we sing, will you come? Just You have been watching the Old Time Gospel Hour originating from the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia. If you would like an audio cassette of today's program, write to Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia, 24514, and enclose a $4 donation. Request program number 498. To become a faith partner and receive this beautiful faith partner Bible, Call toll-free 1-800-446-5000 for complete information. Once again, that free number is 1-800-446-5000. Now, this is John Corrigan inviting you to join us next week for another telecast of the Old Time Gospel Hour. And until then, may God richly bless you is our prayer. This has been a presentation of the Liberty Broadcasting System.